Good. Okay. So I'm going to uh, describe what we've been doing with ORCIDs at Oxford. It's been quite a, um, a long project so far, I suppose, to get us going. First of all, a little bit of context about the university. There is a, a great challenge of managing the research outputs at Oxford because um, it's quite a large university of over 5,000 research active staff. We've got over 5,000 research students, so it's a research intensive university. Uh, we're not entirely sure exactly the number of articles that are produced each year. We reckon somewhere in the region of 16,000. Coupled with this, the institution is highly devolved, so um, a lot of decision making is devolved to the academic divisions and departments rather than being a, a top down structure. Now, the relevance to ORCID is that we had um, a person identifiers group because the problem across the university of, uh, of identifying individuals was becoming quite um, critical. And uh, we felt that we had to pull people together from different units around the university to try and resolve some of these problems with using the initiatives that are ongoing, ORCID being one of them. So this group was pulled together, um, it was led by the, the Bodleian, and we had representatives from all the, uh, the, the relevant uh, groups around the university, including student administration and legal services. And um, we decided that ORCID is probably our first action because it was coming onto the global scene quite um, quite significantly at the point that the group was set up. Seemed a bit like a quick win. So we put a proposal to one of the university subcommittees, the Research Infor Management, Information Management Subcommittee, <laughs> quite a mouthful that one, that we should start moving with ORCID at the university. That is a, a committee that's chaired by the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and includes um, some academic rep representatives as well, so it was important to get that buy-in. And um, research services was one of our key stakeholders in the work that we were doing. It was decided at that point that um, our approach should be very lightweight. The reason being that the control and ownership of personal information we felt very strongly was should remain with the academics again sort of mirroring this devolved model um, that we have at Oxford. We were also advised by legal services that you know we should involve as little personal information as possible with um, any connections that we were making. And one of our other considerations when going forward with ORCIDs was the value proposition for authors, basically the what's in it for me. And this is the model that we came up with extremely lightweight. What we wanted to do was we wanted to link people's Oxford account with ORCID and so we created a model where the user can log into their personal account using single sign-on at the Oxford end and they can either request a new ORCID or link an existing ORCID and all the information that would be sent to ORCID was their name and their email and their affiliation and that was it. <clears throat> that would be um, picked up at the ORCID end where the person can then confirm that they want to associate their ORCID with their Oxford account and that is then sent back to Oxford where the connection is made back in our core user directory or COD. Very simple, very lightweight, and we felt that would be more acceptable than trying to go heavy-handed into this and um, gaining control of people's orchids accounts. So that was the that was the plan, and we felt quite happy with that. And it meant that the author retained all the control. We were not going to go creating accounts on behalf of all our authors it was up to the author to actually initiate this. And the timing was perfect because just at the timing that we were getting going with this, the GISC, which is a major funding body in the UK uh, for such uh, matters, 
and ARMA, which is the Association of Research Managers and Administrators who are scratching their heads about person identifiers, they came up with um, a little project and were offering a bit of money for a number of institutions to pilot ORCIDs to get it going in the UK. They're short projects, so just a matter of months, and um, Oxford was fortunate enough to be successful in our application for funding. The intention at this point, because we were, felt we were moving quite quickly with ORCIDs, was to focus on the soft areas of the implementation, so the rollout, the promotion and the publicity. In fact, what happened was we got quite, I wouldn't say bogged down, it's perhaps too strong a term, but we um, got quite engrossed in uh, examining what we called the triangulation of ORCIDs because Oxford is a symplectic user and there are implications for connecting ORCIDs from our symplectic instance as well. I'll come on to that a bit more later. One of the main um, outcomes of the JISC-ARMA ORCID pilot projects was sharing, ex sharing experiences with other UK institutions who were also trying to do the same thing at the same time. And one of the major outcomes of the whole project, which again I'll talk about a little bit later, is the JISC consortial agreement with ORCID for the UK. So this is what took up an awful lot of time for us at Oxford. We have, um, we wanted to link ORCIDs to our CUD, the core user directory as I mentioned, but we also are symplectic users and there's uh, a possibility to, to link your symplectic account with ORCID. And we decided that we wanted to make it as simple as possible for our users and for them only to have to link once. And we were looking at ways where people could link either via the card or symplectic and the connection would be made with both systems. Now at that point not every member of the university was a symplectic user. So if we made the link via symplectic it meant that we would miss out half of Oxford's academics and if we went via the CUD, then people who had a symplectic account wouldn't be connected with ORCID. So this is why we were trying to get this, this um, sort of one-stop link there. And we came up with a number of options. First one was the, the trivial option. I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but just to sort of show the complexity of what we were looking at. Um, the first one was the trivial option where we just linked the CUD to ORCID. And the second one was where we separately linked the COD to ORCID and Symplectic to ORCID. Um, we felt that, that that option would be confusing to academics having to link twice. Then the, the second option is that the Oxford pages um, were master or elements became master. And finally, we had these two options, full synchronization and single callback. I'm not going to go into all the, detail, the gory detail of that, but um, the outcome of all this um, investigation was that we decided to go for the very first option, the simple link. The reason that we did this at the time was um, we had standard membership of um, ORCID, and to get two separate links to ORCID, we were going to have to increase to premium membership, which was a significant jump in the cost to the university, and the university at that point was not prepared to pay the extra cost. Also, we were thinking about the confusion uh, to our academics having to make two links. We felt that if they linked their symplectic to ORCID, they then would be under the impression that they had linked themselves to Oxford and would then question, you know, why, why do I have to do this twice? So we decided to take the easy route and the uh, technology, the link between Oxford and the COD was set up and was working fine. So we were very pleased to be able to, to do that. And at the end of the uh, JISC Armour project, we were really pleased to hear that ORCID was talking with JISC about a consortial agreement for the UK because that in one fell swoop 
resolve the cost problem if we wanted to set up more than one link with ORCID and we knew that the university would um, be happy with the current membership that we were paying. All of this um, had to fit in with a parallel project that we're doing, a big open access service design project. So at the same time that we're considering all the links to ORCID, we've been thinking about how we're going to design a whole one-stop shop service to cover open access at the university. And the driver for this, um, as some of you may have heard, is that the research excellence framework, the, the um, the new version of the research assessment exercise um, in the UK was mooting that it might want ORCIDs for submissions to the next REF. So this is where the overlap came and we're having to think about the service that we offer to academics to try and simplify their submissions at the, what's the word, that what they have to do in order to be compliant with the next ref. So this all came nicely together. So the JISC National Consortium, which was only announced oh, a couple of weeks ago, well, less than that, perhaps 23rd of June, is fantastic for the UK because uh, certainly for the University of Oxford, we now have, we'll be getting premium membership of ORCID to at the same price pretty well that we were paying for standard membership and this is great because it opens up the possibilities there of dual links uh, should we want to take them up and it's very likely that we will at some point in the future. For the moment we've just got the one link from the COD to ORCID. So progress so far, we're, we've got the GIST consortial agreement and Oxford has already signed up for that. The technical development for linking Oxford ORCIDs via the CUD to ORCID is all set up and working, which is great. We have produced publicity materials and some guidelines for authors, so instructions, um, which are ready to roll there. And we're just starting our training programs for library staff and beginning to roll out uh, further to academics. The Oxford ORCID link was released only in May, so it's all pretty new for us still. And the advocacy and communications strategy is being planned. So we've got a few early adopters. I think we've got about 130 odd links at the moment, so it's tiny. But we want to make sure that people understand what they need to do, why they, why they need to do it, and basically why they should link their ORCID with Oxford rather than going just getting an ORCID. This is the what's in it for me question. So I think generally why authors should have an ORCID is beginning to gain traction because people are becoming a little bit more aware of it via their um, publishers when, you know, when they're submitting a journal article and so on. And I think uh, they're beginning to learn that their friends have got an orchid so that they um, they want to go and get one as well. So the, the idea of it, you know, helping to distinguish them from other people with the same name to get credit for their work and that is getting going. I can't say it's common knowledge yet, but it is getting going. I think we've still got work to do there uh, to help people understand what orchids are and what they're for, particularly issues like, you know, it's not a password, it is very much um, something which should be publicised and made public, and the benefits to, or to authors for having their own ORCID. As I say, I think it will become um, much more commonplace and people have heard of them very soon. I know that OUP, Oxford University Press, has included ORCIDs in their submission system, so people will begin to see it around a lot more. However, why they should link it to Oxford at the moment is um, a difficult one to sell. We know the benefits within the libraries and information systems. We can see the future benefits here for sort of, um, you know, making life easier for, well, for all of us um, in, in people not having to enter information twice, being able to uniquely identify people in different systems and so on. But that sort of thing is not going to benefit our authors tomorrow. We've got a lot of work to do before that will actually become a reality. 
but we do want to get people going as soon as possible with creating those links so that we can then build the reality. It's a bit of a chicken and egg um, situation, I think. We've got to think carefully about how we push this out so that we can start that ball rolling and get that sort of nudge effect where everybody else is doing it so everybody wants to join in. I think uh, one, one tack might be to get people, new people as they join the university and new researchers and sort of take it from there. We're also looking at working with some early adopters within our pilot departments who, who were part of the open access pilot that we've just finished and we're beginning to roll out. So that's a cohort of people that we could target. One critical driver that has come on stream just in the last month is that the Wellcome Trust, a significant funder, will be requiring Oxfords and Oxfords, ORCIDs on grant applications from the 1st of August this year. So actually we've got quite a job to do um, over the next month to make sure that all people who are going to be applying for Wellcome Trust funding in a month's time have an ORCID and know what it is and why they need it and are aware of how they can link it to Oxford. So that's our, our first priority. As far as the next REF goes, at the moment it's not uh, stated that it will be a requirement for the next REF, but were HEFKE to require all submission um, needs, uh, needs an ORCID for all the applicants there, then that will be a huge driver for the UK. Now, as I say, it's not a requirement yet, but this is the sort of thing that we can float to academics to say, you know, it may be a requirement, um, and this, this is the, the level that the discussions are at, and so, you know, it's a good idea to get an ORCID and link it to Oxford. Now, we've still got a lot of work to do. Although we've got that link um, there, we um, still have some requirements there. One thing which we're using as one of our uh, selling points to authors is that on their ORCID account, if they link their Oxford account to their ORCID account, their affiliation to Oxford displays on their ORCID account. And it's verified there because otherwise, if you manually put in your affiliation, you could, you could in theory, type in anything. So you get that nice verification which appears on your ORCID account. Uh, we, we would like it to appear a little bit more prominently on their ORCID account, but that's, you know, that's something which we can talk about uh, in the future with the ORCID people who've been hugely helpful, I should say. Um, so that's, that's our unique selling point to authors at the moment, which isn't much, but I think it's important to some of our authors. Our requirements still, uh, are within thinking about the symplectic triangulation, and we're considering now that we've got premium membership, having those two separate links to ORCID. What we need to do is clarify to authors that they are separate links and they need to make both of them. So that's something which we may do in the, um, in the near future. Um, we will be creating ORCID, <laughs> symplectic accounts for all members of the university before too long, we think, uh, because of the open access service design outcomes. We need to um, think very carefully about how we're going to use ORCIDs within the open access programme and research data management activities. There is a lot going on at the moment and we need to uh, consider how we would integrate ORCIDs into all of those activities. So this is where we are at this precise moment. I took a paper about ORCID integration to um, the renamed uh, subcommittee I mentioned before, which is now the Research Information Management and Technology Subcommittee. And these were the questions that I asked of that committee. Um, first of all, just to note the uh, status quo of where we'd got to, and to endorse a plan of action so basically to approve that we would concentrate to begin with on the Wellcome Trust applicants, which is a bit of a no-brainer, we've got to do it, um, that they were happy with our current communications activities that we are undertaking, that we need to draft an ORCID 
at Oxford strategy. We need to know where we're going with this because even though we've got that connection, it's a question of, well, what do we do now? And then we want to scope further ORCID integration um, and the outcome of that uh, have, a, have a roadmap for implementation. So we want to run this as a mini project, a sort of fast and furious project in the autumn where we will engage a number of staff, um, well, not, not new staff, but current staff working in this area to work on questions such as how do we integrate ORCID with our institutional repository? What are the options for um, saving ORCIDs underneath the repository? Um, how, will we include ORCIDs for non-Oxford authors within our repository? If we do, how do we do that? Uh, the REOX protocol, how, what are the requirements for that and how do we comply with that for data exchange? Things like um, Symplectic for importing ORCIDs from the COD and ORCID into Symplectic, how do we do it? We also need to look at other factors such as HESA, the Higher Education Statistics Agency, which the university has, has a, um, a requirement to um, deliver a return every year on statistics for the university, which are then built into a UK picture. They have already included ORCIDs in their um, list of data fields. I don't think they're mandatory yet, but chances are that they will be at some point. As I've already mentioned, the HEFCI requirements, that's something which we need to take into account. And the Research Councils UK have a system called Research Fish for reporting outcomes from research projects. And ORCIDs have been included in there. Again, I don't think they're mandatory at the moment, but we need to be prepared in case these um, external bodies decide that ORCIDs should be mandatory. So um, we want to put together a scoping project to cover all of these questions and to provide answers for those questions so that then we can have a clear roadmap as to what we're doing across the university um, to integrate ORCIDs, not just with the institutional repository, but across the piece. And that's a, a quick canter through what we're doing at Oxford and where we've got to. Um, it doesn't answer all the questions, but um, hopefully that will then um, give some room for discussion now. So I'll hand over back to Paul.